Open your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 20. Put your bookmark there. It's where we're going to study today. I join with John Tom and John and uh, those who have already offered a welcome to you, especially to those of you that are visiting. We thank you for taking time from your holiday weekend uh, to be with us. It's an encouragement to us, and we're grateful that you are here and hope you get to enjoy your holiday. Uh, We are blessed to live in this country, and uh, while our primary loyalty is to a heavenly uh, country, uh, I'm glad to be an American, and I uh, am uh, grateful for those who have uh, allowed that for us, and I know you are too, and so uh, kind, of a, kind of a double celebration for, for us today. So uh, I, hope, I hope you get to enjoy that somewhat. Uh, you see the memory verse uh, on the board behind us. We're going to get to this, so uh, don't, you don't have to warm up your vocal cords quite yet. Uh, This is the beginning of July, and so we're going to uh, kind of take our examination of the life of Jesus and the qualities of Jesus and our efforts to imitate Jesus uh, to the next step this month. And we're going to talk about Jesus in regards to the concept of service, or Jesus as a servant. And, And I want to begin this morning by calling your attention to a statement that the Apostle Paul makes in Galatians chapter 2. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul at this point is addressing a a, a bit of a conflict that he had with Peter because of Peter's reluctance to continue to have fellowship with Gentiles when Jewish Christians had come to visit Antioch. And uh, there is this ongoing issue in the early days of the spread of the gospel about how much of the law of Moses people were actually accountable to. The, The Jewish Christians... Uh, Very many of them were pushing the idea that you still had to be circumcised. You still had to observe some of the ceremonies of the law of Moses. And Paul was trying very hard not to allow that mindset to become a a divisive thing among early Christians. And so he he recounts uh, an incident when Peter comes to Antioch and that there was some conflict because Peter uh, had withdrawn himself from some of the Gentiles. And So Paul makes the argument that we left behind the idea of being made innocent because of our relationship to the law of Moses. And in the midst of this, he makes a statement most of you are familiar with, a fairly well-known statement, when he says in verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, this is one of those passages that because it is so familiar to us, I'm not sure that we sometimes grasp the extent of the meaning here. Uh, When Paul addresses the idea that he's been crucified with Christ, I think sometimes the imagery of it becomes so poignant that we forget exactly what it is that he's saying. What he's saying is, I don't make choices in my life anymore for me. Everything I do in my life, I do as directed by my service to God. And and let me suggest to you folks that when it comes to discipleship, what Paul is arguing in Galatians chapter 2 is the greatest challenge. True and complete service to God, self-sacrifice. Now, now I tell you, in some ways, service and self-sacrifice, and those two things go together, in some ways, that's fairly easy. And we recognize that we're supposed to do good things as we serve the Lord. One of the qualities that we're told of Jesus when Peter goes to, in Acts 10 and preaches to Nicodemus is that everybody knows Jesus went around doing good. That's an argument that Peter makes to him. And we look at that and we realize that when it comes to our actions... We're supposed to make some sacrifices. We're supposed to serve God. We're supposed to serve others. Galatians chapter 6 tells us, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So we recognize, Titus 2, we're supposed to be zealous of good works. I I don't know a Christian that's going to argue that, but, but let me suggest to you what's the harder thing. The harder thing is here. It's not necessarily hard when you see somebody that's in need and, and, and you take time to do something good. I recognize sometimes that requires some time or it requires some money. Or, uh, but but for, the, for the most part, I know very few Christians who would not make some sacrifice in action as the need arises. But real service, folks, begins in the mind. 
in, in the book of Philippians, if you're still in Galatians, you just flip over one or two uh, of the letters, you, you'll notice a, a, a statement that Paul makes to these folks, and we're going to come back to this before the lesson's over, so if you've got more than one bookmark, you might want to stick it there or, or take your spouse's finger and put it there and let them leave it there the whole service. That'll be fun. Uh, go, uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5 says, uh, Let this mind be in you which also was in Christ who being in the form of God did not consider it, et cetera, et cetera. And he goes on to talk about Jesus as a servant. And, and, but I want you to notice that he begins with, this is the mentality that, that has to pervade your life. And let me suggest to you folks, learning to think service, like a servant, as a servant, with, with a mindset that says, I've been crucified with Christ, and so I just don't think about me anymore. My life, Paul says, is hidden with Christ. That, that's the real challenge. And that's what I want to talk with you about a little bit this morning. Turn over to Matthew chapter 20. Uh, when you get over there, if you want to give your attention to the, to the PowerPoint, and let, let's do our memory verse. Uh, this is the, the, the object of our focus this morning, especially verse 28. Uh, Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Let's look at this passage a little bit, consider a couple of concepts, and, and give some thought to what we can do to be better servants and to appreciate Jesus as a servant. And so I call your attention back there, and I want to begin by looking at the context a little bit. And what I want you to appreciate about the context here is that it well illustrates that the greatest obstacle to servitude is me. I don't mean me, Russ, the preacher, that I'm the greatest obstacle to your servitude, although that may be the case from time to time. The reality is for each one of us, the great obstacle to servitude is self. And you see that reflected in what happens leading up to this little conversation that takes place. Uh, Matthew chapter 20, in beginning, really the context begins in, in verse uh, 17, but the statement that Jesus makes in verses 25, 6, 7, and 8 is a statement that's made to, to the apostles. And, and I think it's important to appreciate how significant was the idea that the apostles had a firm understanding and commitment to Jesus' doctrine. Uh, you know, if the apostles don't get it right, folks, if the apostles don't understand, and if the apostles aren't willing to be the people that Jesus wants them to be, then the gospel fails. And, and, and the older I get, the more I'm convinced that when you get into the later chapters, especially of Matthew and Luke, that, that what you start seeing is that Jesus is taking more and more time to take these 12 guys... Get them off away from everyone else. And I think there's a couple of reasons. Jesus is staying away as much as possible, but he's traveling up to Tyre and Sidon, and then he's up close to Caesarea Philippi, and then he's down in Perea, and he's on this side of the Sea of Galilee, and he's on this side of the Sea of Galilee. He's just constantly moving around. But a lot of times when he's moving around, the statement is that he goes off someplace away from the crowds, and he's talking to the apostles, and he's trying to get them to understand exactly what it is that he wants them to appreciate. If they don't get it, the whole scheme fails. And, and, and that's impressive to me, that, that God placed upon these 12 men such a huge responsibility. You and I, folks, wouldn't be here as children of God were it not for these 12 guys. And when you study them and you study what's going on, it is the more remarkable that they are really and become the first wave of servants in the kingdom. It's remarkable because they're not there yet, even at this point. So Matthew chapter 20, verse 17, here's the, uh, here, here's the immediate discussion. Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify, and the third day he will rise again. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with their sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, 
one on your right hand and on the other on the left in your kingdom. Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm about to be baptized with? They said to him, We are able. So he said to them, You will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. When the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased. I'm reading from the New King James, by the way, and this is one verse where I think they got it really, really wrong. The older versions say they were moved with indignation. Okay, They weren't just displeased, they were hacked off. All right? When the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. Whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The argument that you see here and the effort on the part of James and John to be on the right hand and left hand of Jesus betrays a a problem that goes all the way back to the end of chapter 16. So if you've got your Bible there and you want to flip back, I want to run through some things that happen uh, over the, the preceding chapters because I think this has a lot to do with why Jesus says what He says here. And it helps us to understand... The, the point that Jesus is trying to make. When you get back to Matthew 17, the end of 16, the beginning of 17, what you have is the, the transfiguration account in Matthew's account. And by the way, the parallels, if you want to look at them sometime, are Mark 9 and Luke 9, and they give us a few details. But what happens is Jesus goes up onto the mountain of transfiguration. You remember he takes Peter, James, and John. And they go up and they see Jesus transfigured and uh, see Moses and Elijah with him appearing in glory, talking about his, uh, his soon decease or demise in Jerusalem. And Peter proposes to build tabernacles, and Jesus uh, 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 shoots that argument down, and God speaks, this is my beloved son, hear him. Peter, James, and John are scared to death. This all happens during the night. There's a bright light, there's a cloud there in velvet by. And when it all is said and done, those three guys must have been looking at each other like, what in the world just happened here? And they spend the night on the mountain as they're on their way down. They've got some questions. They ask about Elijah's return. They ask about the resurrection because Jesus mentions that. They ask about John the Baptist. And Jesus tells these three men, don't tell anybody what you saw up on the mountain. As they come back down and they get down to the region of Caesarea Philippi, which is at the base of the mountain, they run into another incident. And if you're looking at Matthew 17, this is kind of how the story goes, so I'm paraphrasing. When they get to the bottom of the mountain, the other nine disciples who are waiting for them to come back are involved in an argument, and the argument is with a man who has brought his child uh, who is demon-possessed. And he asked the disciples of Jesus to cast the demon out of the child, and they can't do it. And so the Pharisees have the nine apostles cornered, and they are grilling them. And Jesus shows up. And the man runs to Jesus, tells him about his son. Jesus, according to Luke's account, is a bit exasperated at this point. This is where he says, Oh, oh ye of little faith, how long do I have to bear with this generation? I think he's talking about his apostles. And so he casts the demon out of the child, and the the apostles then ask him, Why why couldn't we cast him out? Well, because if your faith was stronger, like a grain of mustard seed, and I recognize this is a tough one, but, but the reality is, this is an issue of prayer and fasting. This is an issue of faith. And Jesus is concerned about their trusting God. And so they go down the road and they start talking. Can you imagine what they're talking about at this point? Mark and Luke tell us that they have a discussion about who's going to be the greatest among them in the kingdom. And Jesus even asks them, what are you arguing about? And they won't tell Jesus. That's in Mark and Luke's account. 
In Matthew's account, in chapter 18, they finally asked Jesus, who then, and this is verse 1, who then is the greatest? And really, the reading is, who is the greater in the kingdom? Uh, Jesus knows what they're arguing about, and it's not hard to figure out. Can't you just see these guys walking down the road, and the nine who failed to cast the demon out, who Jesus is a little exasperated with, they're all feeling like failures, and Peter, James, and John are walking down the road like, I got a secret. What happened on the mountain? Oh, you should have been there, but I can't tell you about it. Why can't you tell us? Oh, Jesus told us not to tell anybody. Now, that may not have been the way it worked out, but there's some reason that they're arguing about which one of them is the greatest in the kingdom. And that's what I'm seeing in my mind that these three guys who are privileged in some ways to see things and know things and then told don't tell the others and the others start asking and one group failed and the other group saw something marvelous. Even Peter at the end of his life in 2 Peter chapter 1 is writing about the transfiguration and what an impact it had upon him and, and now they're arguing. On the top of the fact that you got two sets of brothers you got a, 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 a Canaanite, a, 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 a militant fundamentalist, and, and you got a tax collector, and these are the twelve. Don't you know they had some arguments as it was? And so in Matthew 18 and verse 1, Jesus tells them, pulls the child, except you become as little children, you can't even enter the kingdom of heaven, warns them about how they are to act to one another, gives them instructions about humility and forgiveness. And you would think, folks that they'd take care of it. If Jesus walked down right here and got 12 of us together and said, let me tell you guys something. I'm going to pull this kid over here and sit in my lap, and unless you start acting like this kid, you can't go to heaven. You can't be a part of my kingdom. You're not even going to be in it, much less are you going to be the greatest. So start thinking about one another and start forgiving one another. And Peter says, how often? Jesus says, many times as it takes, 490 times. Don't you, I mean, if Jesus did that to you, would that make an impact on you? I mean, I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm never going to go there again. And yet, if you go over to the end of Luke, in Luke chapter 22, on Jesus' last night with them, at the Last Supper, when he tells them one of you is going to betray me, and they start questioning which one of them it's going to be, Luke tells us that they started arguing again about which one of them was going to be the greatest in the kingdom and that there was an ongoing rivalry. Why is it, do you reckon, that these 12 guys can't get beyond this, which one of us is greater than the other? Well, I I think of a lot of reasons. Uh, I think part of it is that they're just men, okay? And they are probably in some ways impressed with where they stand next to the Messiah. Maybe it's just manliness and the idea that you get more than two or three guys together, somebody's going to have to act like he's better than the other two or three. That, that kind of competitive nature, that, that, that uh, contest in, in regards to pride and ambition and competitiveness, that, that, that's a challenge, I think, to everybody at some point in their life. And I want you to appreciate and think about yourself. You may be the most mild-mannered person in the world, but there is a point in your life where you think you've got the answer or you're right and you want to be the one. Everybody somewhere in some circumstance is there. These guys aren't any different. Now, I I know that we idolize the apostles and they did great work, but at this point, they're like we tend to be. And I'll tell you the other thing to think about. They're not Christians yet. They don't get it all yet. They're not fully trained yet. They're not completely committed to the nature of Christ yet. They're not completely instructed in the mind of Christ yet. And so they are children being taught, and they are arguing and arguing and arguing. So you come to Matthew chapter 20. And Jesus tells them on the road going down to Jerusalem... That, okay, when we get there, guys, let me tell you what's going to happen. I'm going to get arrested. I'm going to get tried. 
and the Jews are going to, I'm going to be betrayed, and the Jews are going to deliver me over to the Gentiles, and they're going to scourge me, and then they're going to kill me. And in three days, I'm going to rise again. Luke tells us in his account, in Luke chapter 9, that at this point, excuse me, it's Mark's account, Mark chapter 10, that, that they are amazed and afraid as they go down the road, and that Jesus says to them again, this is going to happen. We know he's told them two times before in Matthew's account. Matthew 16, he tells them. Matthew 17, he tells them. So he's telling them again and again as they're on their way to Jerusalem. At this point, they believe it enough that they are amazed Jesus is still going and that they're afraid of themselves even going, but at the same time, they don't understand it all. Luke tells us that they didn't understand the resurrection. And so they've got to be some confused guys. Jesus can raise the dead. Jesus can walk on water. Jesus can feed thousands of people with nothing. Jesus can heal all kinds of illness. And now you're telling me that you're going to die? And, and that you're going to be delivered and you're going to be betrayed? You are God. I, I believe Peter is suspicious at least that, he, that Jesus is God. He's the Son of God. That's what he calls him. What's going to happen to this movement? What's going to happen to the kingdom? What's going to happen to all these thousands and thousands and thousands of people that come every time you stop somewhere? What's going to happen? And their, their wheels are turning, and they're trying to figure it out. And so we are told that James and John, through their mother, come and ask this question. If you read Mark's account, James and John are behind this, not their mother. Their mother is a tool... And she may be a relative. There are some people that think James and John and Jesus were cousins by their mothers. And so they use their mom, go up there and ask Jesus if we can be on the right and the left. They don't want to be the king, but I'll tell you what I've got in my mind, and this is just my opinion. You can piece this together as you will. I think James and John see themselves as the kingdom enforcers, and, and here's why. Do you remember when they were first called to be apostles in Mark's account that Jesus gave them a nickname? Anybody remember that? Shake your head. Yes, you remember that? Sons of Thunder, Boanerges. I mean, if somebody called me Son of Thunder, I'd kind of walk around puffed up, you know? And what's even more interesting is if you read Luke's account in Luke chapter 9 when they come down from the mountain of transfiguration... It's James and John that come up to Jesus and say, hey, there's a guy over here casting out demons in your name, and we told him he didn't need to be doing that because he wasn't following us. Do you see? They're jealous for their little group. Jesus said, well, if he's not against us, he's for us. And then they go down towards Jerusalem, and they go through Samaria, and the Samaritans don't like it that Jesus is passing through. And so James and John come up to Jesus and say, hey, can we, you, would you like us to just call down he, uh, fire from heaven and burn these guys up like Elijah did? Now, now they're, they're jealous for Jesus, but I want you to see the mindset. It's interesting to me that John is the disciple Jesus loved and that James is going to be the first martyr. And if you think it through and piece it together, they come to Jesus, they want to sit on the right hand and the left hand in his glory. I don't think they understand what's going to happen, but they know he's told them in Matthew 19... Uh, you're going to sit on 12 thrones judging 12 tribes of Israel, and they're trying to put this all together, and they've got it in their mind that we're going to make sure this kingdom goes. That's the way I see this. So they come and they ask if they can be on the right hand and the left. And Jesus basically says, are you, are you willing to pay the price? I, I want to make a little point about this in, in verses 22 and 23. Yeah, let me tell you something that ambition and a lack of, of, of a mind to serve does for us, folks. When we get to thinking too much of ourselves, and that's what's happening with the apostles, and, and we're all, we all fall victim to it. You get to thinking too much about yourself and your life and what's happening to you, and you quit thinking about other people. What happens is you're blinded by glory to the point that when the suffering comes, you're not ready for it. Jesus said, are you able to be baptized with the baptism I'm going to be baptized with? Can you drink my cup? And of course, they're, yeah. Oh, yeah, we're able. They have no idea what they're saying. And they're going to. Jesus says, you will indeed. It's a dangerous thing when we lose a mind of servitude and we just think about ourselves. 
Because when the difficulty comes, we'll fail. And so Jesus goes on to offer this challenge, this admonition to service that we're familiar with. My kingdom's not like the world's kingdoms. There's no hierarchy. There's not those who lord it over and then the greater ones who lord it over them. What he says is, if, if you really think you're something, you really want to be something, then get out there and serve. Make yourself a slave. Just as the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve. Let, let me offer a couple of things we learned from this. Not, not, no elaboration necessary, just a couple of things we learned from this interchange about Jesus. I want you to consider that statement there at the end, first of all, where Jesus says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. I want you to think about, for just a second, the idea that the mind of Jesus, and again, if you want to flip back over to Philippians chapter 2, the, the mind of Jesus is a mind that is given to the concept of servitude. I, I guess if you were going to make this observation number one from, from this little story, it, it is this. Jesus came in order to serve. We think of Jesus coming in order to die. That's true. But it wasn't like He showed up one day, said, I'm God, did a couple of miracles, and died. He spent 33 years on the earth doing good, healing people, taking care of people, showing the love of God, showing the, the, the mindset of God, showing the character of God. This is who God is. God serves. It's always impressed me uh, in, in Ephesians. You don't have to turn over there in Ephesians chapter 1 because Paul begins Ephesians by saying, blessed be the God who blesses us. And if you go back through the history of God's dealings with mankind, God's fundamental disposition towards man is to bless. Well, I would propose that God's fundamental disposition in regards to anything is to serve. And that's, there, there's some irony there, is there not? The creator of all the universe speaks things into existence, hears all the prayers of all of his people all the time. I mean, can you imagine... If my girls start talking at the same time, I get lost. And God's hearing everybody all the time. You start thinking about the practical things that make God, God, and it becomes mind-boggling. And yet, what's His fundamental disposition? What can I do for you? Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Look each of you not only on his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ, who being in the form of God didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant and coming in likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We recognize Jesus was glorified for the work that he did, but Philippians 2 says he didn't come in order to be glorified, he came in order to serve. Who am I that God would do something like that for me? And who am I that I could live or even would think of living my life any other way? God came, Jesus came for the purpose of service. Secondly, service is an intentional choice. He even makes the point in Philippians chapter 2. Jesus determined to serve. Why did He determine that? Because that's who He is. That's, he decided, this is who I am and this is what I can do. Wait, there's great cost here, Lord. Philippians, I mean, Matthew 20, 28. You're going to have to give your life a ransom. You're going to have to die a horrid death. You're going to have to spend all your life proving who you are. You're going to be rejected. You're going to be spit on. You're going to be scourged. You're going to have all kinds of terrible things happen to you when all you're doing is trying to help people. That's okay. I'm going to go serve anyway. 
Service is an intentional choice. It was for Jesus and it is for us. And that's why the Philippian writer says, adopt this mind. So how do you do that? Well, you focus on everybody but yourself. And you do it 24-7. And that's hard. I struggle with it every day of my life. And my suspicion is you struggle with it every day of your life. I hear people get all wound up and upset because they don't like this, that, or the other. And you know what I want to say? You're just being selfish. And you know what happens if I say you're just being selfish? They just get mad because they're being selfish. And I get mad because I'm being selfish. Shame on the whole lot of us. Service is an intentional act that requires discipline, that requires effort, that that requires a mind that's constantly thinking outwardly. And it is so easy to become lazy and focus upon ourselves. That's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbors and hate your enemy. That's easy to do. But I say, love your enemies, bless those that curse you, do good to those that hate you, pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you, that you might be the children of your Father who is in heaven, because that's who He is. So we have to decide that we will control ourselves. This is, this is one of those areas that we miss out on when we talk about self-control. We think of self-control, we think of anger, we think of lust. What about self-control that thinks of service? Let this mind be in you. Service grows out of that kind of mind. And then the last application is this. This is who Jesus is and why he came. This is what we determined to do. So go do it. You know, it's easy to sit here right now, and my suspicion is if you're like me, you're thinking, i got to do better about this. That's exactly right. I've been kind of selfish and I only think about me and I fall into that trap all the time. Okay, great. What are you going to do about that? Are you just going to go off feeling guilty? Or are you going to make some changes? Jesus says in Matthew 16, if any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow. It's the following, folks. It is the service that we are in need of. It is the... the the getting down on our knees and washing the feet of those whose feet need to be washed because that's what our Lord did and told His apostles, if I can do this as your Lord, you need to do this for one another. And so if it's the local church, then let's get about the business of serving each other. If it's our family, our physical, then let's get about the business of serving each other. If it's our community, let's be people who shine as lights because of our good works. If it is people that need to be taught, let's go serve them. And I recognize that it's demanding and and that it's exhausting and, and that it can be frustrating and discouraging. Don't you think Jesus got frustrated and discouraged always doing good and having people killing for it? That's why Galatians chapter 6 says, let us not grow weary while doing good. We get to choose if we will be servants and imitate our king. When Paul writes in Galatians 2, I've been crucified with Christ. It's not I who live anymore, it's Christ who lives in me. Now that is a worthy goal for all of us, folks, because uh, what happens, and I think Devin made this observation the other day, uh, we, we, we die and bury the old man, Romans chapter 6. problem is he just keeps getting back up. That's not the way dead men do. So if we're going to serve, if we're going to imitate Jesus, look at what he dealt with and how he dealt with the apostles and what the lesson was. You, 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 want, you want God to recognize you, then serve. Make yourself a servant. Make yourself a slave. That's what real greatness is. That's why Jesus is so great. And, and let's notice that that's who He is, and let's make that who we are. And, and, and let's focus on that and work on it. And then let's go be about the business of doing it. And Jesus, as our example, of servitude will 
make an impact on our lives. Then we'll be the disciples we're supposed to be. Thanks for your attention this morning. Hope those things will help you as we start this month working on this. If you're subject to the invitation this morning, we could help you obey the gospel. We invite your